This is Join Us in France, episode 340. 340, for those of you practicing your French. Bonjour, I'm Annie Sargent, and Join Us in France is the podcast where we look around France because we love it here. We talk about French culture, history, gastronomy, and everything it takes to have a lovely time in France. Today, I bring you a conversation with Elise Riven, who is a licensed tour guide, about Auvillard, a gorgeous village in the southwest of France. I think you might just want to put Auvillard on your list because while it's off the beaten track, it's hard to find a more scenic place. Every year there's a TV show on France 3 where each of the 14 regions of France submit their favorite village for the year and we all vote. In 2021, Auvillard was the pick for Occitanie, and I hope they win. Although we don't know yet, but I hope they win. They deserve it. If you like what we do here at Join Us in France, take a look at joinusinfrance.com for slash boutique to check out my books, tours, and services, such as my itinerary reviews, where I help you craft the best vacation in France specifically for you. Follow Addicted to France on Instagram to see my photos of Ovilar. I will post them this week. And the best way to stay in touch with me and with the podcast is to sign up for the newsletter here at joinusinfrance.com forward slash newsletter. I'm going to Paris next week and every day I'll share a Paris photo of the day with my newsletter subscribers. I'll be producing next week's episode early because I won't be able to do it while touring Paris, so there won't be a personal update until episode 342. How nice it is to see you It's across nice to see from you. the table across outside. Across a crowded table. <laughs> no, no. What's that song? Across a crowded room. No, no not yet. It's not it's yet. Not that crowd. No. 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 Just the two of us. <laughs> Just the two of us. I Hope, think. There was a neighbor earlier doing some noisy things. Hopefully we won't hear him too much. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm afraid we're going to be just the two of us or just the three of us for another spell yet. And I know, know if you can hear the birds, but they're singing a lot. They don't have to worry about what's going on. That's right. They don't have to worry about anything. Anyway, today we are together to speak about a village I visited just recently. Lovely, lovely little place called Ovilar. Ovilar. With an R at the end. I kept calling it Ovilac. In my oh. head, I was stuck with a C. No, you it's stuck with a C. R at the end. And it's pretty small. I mean, you know. It's a village. It's a village. It's one of France's most beautiful villages. Yep. And it's now on the list of Le Village Favori des Français. For this year. For this year, for 2021. Right. So so it's it's in the running for it. Right. You know, this is a thing where people vote. Anyway, I voted for. Did you Villa. vote already? Oh, of course I did. But the, the votes are closed. Oh, I didn't even know. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, yeah. Anyway, so beautiful place. I was just there. I would love to hear all about the history because even though I rode my bike around and I made a uh, a nice video for my patrons where I take them on a bike ride around. Oh, you took your bike up to it. Yes, yeah. I, I took them around the village so they could see it. Uh, I don't know that much about the history. So okay. I'm counting on you to uh, fill in the gaps. Fill in the gaps. Well, there are actually a lot of holes. It's not a Swiss cheese, but this is a village <laughs> that's actually, unfortunately, had a lot of holes because of a lot of invasions. But uh, maybe what we should do is situate Ovila. Ovila is in the department called the Tarn et Garonne. Number 82? 82. And it's actually most of it, because actually a little part down below, which is right along the the banks of the Garonne River. But the village that you visited, the village that everybody goes to see, is the part that's up above, uh, up on yeah. top of a hill. It's actually a promontory. It's a rocky promontory. And that is, of course, the reason for its existence, because it actually goes back to pre-Roman times. Uh -huh. uh, there was an opidum there. And I thought maybe it, maybe it's a word I've mentioned a few times that 
Nobody knows for sure exactly what that is. And Opitam was actually a settlement that was surrounded by protection in, in the pre-Roman times. It was usually stone, unlike in Asterix, where it's mostly wood, you know. Yeah. And, um, and it's usually in a place that's very, very good defensively. So you can see in every direction. Mm-hmm. And, and the Opidum was up on the hill. And the Opidum was up on the hill. Okay. And the Romans, basically, when they came through this part of the world, it was like, hmm, don't break a thing that's working. It's a good idea. These are good defensive places. So when the Romans took over and made it into a Roman site that was actually very important because it guarded the Garon River, they kept the structure that was basically a you know walled structure uh, made out of stone. And so the village is very, very, very old, Mm -hmm. very old. And the original name, going back really mostly probably to to Latin, because who knows exactly what it was before, comes from Alta Villa, which simply means high villa. And a villa is a big settlement in, in Roman times. Okay. So it got slowly transformed, but not too much, and into O Villa. Uh, mm-hmm, which, mm-hmm. which is what it officially became uh, in the 1200s. Now, obviously, there is nothing left of the old Opidum. No. Okay. It has been rebuilt a few times since. It's been <laughs> rebuilt uh, many times. But it's actually good that you say that because, of course, the, 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 what's left of the entranceways, you know, into the medieval ramparts, the, what the, what happens almost always is that whatever is rebuilt is always rebuilt on top of. Mm-hmm. So probably if archaeologists could go through with laser things without destroying everything, you know, you would see some remnants of the really most ancient stuff all the way down underneath. You yeah, know? yeah. Because they, there's no reason for them not to simply rebuild on top of what was was already sure, there. Sure, why not? You know? Yeah. So, uh, but but actually, it, it, it its existence in medieval times, which of course means really starting after the Romans end, because the Romans basically used it for both military purposes to guard whatever was going on on the river and has a, a, having a settlement there, you know. But afterwards in the Middle Ages, it was thanks to the commerce on the river that it became flourishing. Right. And so there is a part down below. Um, and that's where, uh, you know, like we've talked of other places like the Dordogne and places like that, where the, bo- the boats are these flat bottomed river boats. And they were the ones that were mostly used for taking things from one po- place to another. And from where Ovilar o- is on the Garonne, it's easy to get to Bordeaux. Mm-hmm. There's no obstacles. There's no real, ob- you know, mm-hmm. other, other, problems in in terms of the river traffic. Yes, and when I was there the Garonne was very quiet, very yeah. calm, very placid, I yeah. guess. Uh, it didn't look like it would be any difficulty to navigate at all. The, the, uh, my understanding is is that from there on uh, the only thing is you have the Dordogne which enters into it but that's close up to Bordeaux. Mm-hmm. Otherwise all of the big other rivers that enter into it have already come. You yeah, know, they've already entered into it, so you really don't have too much danger. Right. Uh, and and I should add that you can actually visit the site where the old port used to be. Yeah, uh, it's there's not much to see there, honestly. Uh, it's a dock, but they've um, made it nice. They've they have uh, nice uh, picnic tables throughout. I didn't notice if there's a bathroom down there, but there are bathrooms up up above public ones, uh, public bathrooms uh, near the um, tourist office. Yeah. Okay. But the down down there, you you can picnic. It's it's a lovely. It's a little, very lovely spot. Yeah, a little place. And, and and they have this one. Sorry, they have this one uh, road, one lane bridge, that's made in the style of the Golden Gate Bridge. Oh, I don't it's, remember seeing that. It's oh, that that's funny. It's a style of suspended bridge. Ah. Yeah. It's, oh, it's very I wonder cute. when it dates from. I don't remember it, but it's possible. I mean, it's, I, I it's understand. pretty old because it's just a one lane bridge. It's a one lane bridge. Yeah. yeah. So it can't, I mean, nowadays nobody builds a one lane bridge anymore. No. <laughs> but, but what's interesting is that, and of course, everything I assume was closed when you were just there last week is that there is a museum of the river transportation and everything, but guess where it is? It's in the clock tower. Ah, okay. And it's a shame because, of course, right now everything is closed. Right, right. You know? Nothing was over. But the two levels inside the clock tower house all the things, photographs, remnants, and everything From that show the, the history of the traffic um, and the commerce uh, on the river. There. What you can still see is a massive anchor. Mm. It's uh, it's uh, bolted to the front of the mairie. Yeah. 
And so you can't miss it. It's ginormous. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's very interesting. I mean, sometimes, you you know, now we see a lot of these villages as just being picturesque, but they really had lives, you know, they had yeah. industry and lives. And, and that was one of the things I, I actually found out reading about it. So Ovila, which has therefore been around for all this time, it was sacked by the Vikings. <laughs> um, the Vikings, you know, they came up Garand as far as Toulouse. And so... Uh, Ovilar, I was like, oh, well, this looks like way. a good place, you know, yeah. let's, let's stop here and do a little pillaging, you yeah, know, I let's mean, do that, yeah. so they came through in the 800s and, uh, it was apparently a, pretty bad, um, mm -hmm. they, they actually destroyed a lot of what existed up until the time and the history of what happened, it really starts becoming a good history, uh, after the year 1000, mm. you know, because that's when the, the Vikings no longer came. To be honest, I have no idea why. I don't know. Maybe they just got tired of just looting and stayed where they were. I have no idea. You know, <laughs> they went to England. That was good. They just went over on the other side, you know, <laughs> stopped coming around here, you know. Um, but then what happened was, uh, the area that it's in, uh, was part of, uh, a region that still is called the Lomagna, Lomagna, which is, uh, these are all designations from ancient times because there was a Viscount. And the Viscount of Lomagna set his sights on Ovilar. And so he built, uh, a small chateau. I don't know if there was anything really to see in, in terms of a chateau there. Did, I did not see a chateau. I think it was really the one that was, it was one of the things that was destroyed during the war of religion, un unfortunately. Probably. But so there was first a Viscount of Lomagna, which is a region that starts there and goes up north almost into, uh, the Lot area. Uh, and, and then. I mean, wait, wait, wait. There's something right by the church, l'église Saint-Pierre. There's a, thing that might have been a chateau or part of, part, part of a chateau at, at one time could have been it's funny because i don't remember honestly i was there a number of probably i was there five six years ago and i just remember at the time of course everything was open and we went in to see some of the art exhibits and things that were inside mm -hmm. and walked around that it had was not my first time there so i'm not sure to be honest, yeah. I don't remember anymore. Yeah, I'm not certain, but it's it's near the church. Near the church. That there's there's this one thing. It's it's very pretty, and it might have been part of a chateau at some it point. It could have been. It could have been, or it could have been part of the convent. But what happened was that it, it, this was an area interesting because it was a it's on land that was disputed between the English and the French. So it it actually became part of the land of the Counts of Armagnac afterwards. Mm. This is the time of the Three Musketeers, right? And then. When Henry the Fourth became king of France, and he was king of Navarre, which is basically a tiny kingdom in the Pyrenees, because this was a town that was affiliated with him, it officially became part of France, but not until 1589. Mm, mm -mm. So yeah. it was really part of one of these separate little southern kingdoms until until that time. So it's it it suddenly became a part of the kingdom when Henry the Fourth became king. And uh, continued, unfortunately, uh, I was just reading, it says, it doesn't even go into details. It was fought over when there was the war with the Qatar. It was for, fought over when the English and the French, a uh, hundred years later, started fighting again. It was fought over during the War of Religions. And it must not have been very easy to live there. No, you know? no, yeah. But probably not. one of the things that made it prosperous, and that started, in fact... Really just, I guess, when all of these things calmed down a little bit. And this is interesting because I wouldn't have expected it to be there. But there was a porcelain factory there. Ah, yes. I didn't see any remnants of that either, even though I knew there had been a, fa a porcelain factory. It was uh, made prosperous because of it. Yeah. Now, th this time when you went, was there anywhere where there were photos to show the kind of porcelain that they made? No, because everything was closed. Everything was it closed. It was a Sunday on top of everything. Yeah. So even the tourist office was closed. Right. All the restaurants and cafes were oh, closed, right. obviously. Closed, right. All right. I think there was one place where you could do takeout, but we had brought our sandwiches. Yeah. But it, I, I couldn't find any pictures, which was kind of frustrating because there are other areas where when they produce a kind of ceramics, there's always a picture that you yeah, can find. Yeah. But anyway, they, they, there was a, a porcelain factory there and porcelain requires a certain kind of earth called kaolina which is why i was actually surprised because it's a very specific kind of uh, earth that you have to use uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's not like clay um but anyway it, it was very prosperous and of course because they had the port there they could ship out uh, a lot of the yeah. porcelain from there and also it had 
another factory, I don't know what you'd really call it a factory in the 1600s, but uh, that made the uh, pens out of the feathers, uh, plumes. Yeah, the plume uh, d'oie. Plume, the plume d'oie. Yeah, yeah, they, they sold a lot of um, feathers, yes. So these, but these were specifically, obviously, because this is a region that's very close to Gers, where, of course, there are lots and lots of geese and lots of ducks anyway. But so they obviously had access to enormous numbers of these feathers, and they manufactured what really would we call a a plume pen, you know, the, the, the kind where it was still the feather that you dip into ink. Yeah. And it, that was, it's, those were its two specialties and it made the village very, very wealthy. Mm -hmm. And so that lasted actually from the early 1600s until the 19th century. Hmm. And, uh, the, the, I'm not sure why the porcelain factory stopped. Hmm. Uh, there, there didn't seem to be any explanation for why it stopped. Of course, we know why the, the feather stopped because they started inventing other forms of pens yeah you know and, yeah, and nobody and, writes like that and anymore. that was that was it you know but but those were the two most prosperous periods of of the history of ovilar hmm. and uh uh then it just became a kind of sleepy village if you look at the demography of it it's really interesting it never had that many people even at the max it had not quite two thousand mm -hmm. and then it went down to the 900s 800s and now it's something like 700 or something like right. that Right. Uh, it was not sleepy on the day we went because it was a beautiful day right. and we were still able to go places. Yeah. <laughs> so, right. you know, French people, there were a bunch of people, there was a bunch of people on motorcycles. There was a, probably a motorcycle club, club. Yeah. came through. Um, there were a lot of people in um, little trailers, uh, um, camper vans, camper vans type things. Not the ma big massive ones right. that you see in the U.S. They're more modest size, but but there were a lot of them. Hmm. Uh, yeah, and there were obviously it was all local tourists. It was all local French people. Not, right. I did not hear any, any foreign, English or yeah, no. yeah. yeah no. It, it, Ovilar is actually fairly well known both um, this side that is towards Toulouse, but also on the east side going towards Bordeaux. It's famous for being a beautiful village. Oh, it really is. And, and so it, it's also famous because over the years in the, at least in the 20th century, it's a place that has become an artist colony. And so two of the spaces that unfortunately, of course, were closed are constantly open for different groups of artists to have exhibits. And one of the things that I remember seeing the last time I was there was a very big art show. I don't know if it's a community, of a cooperative that, you know, people participate in or if it was a competition, to be honest. I don't remember if it was mm -hmm. one of those. But it was big and it was, there was a lot of, there was a lot. There was sculpture, there was painting. And I know that there are a group of uh, artists that have taken residence there and they have, writing residencies there every year of course since covid this has stopped but i know two people personally who have participated in writing residencies there and uh, writing residencies yeah you go for a period of anywhere from one month to uh, uh several months i don't know if it's the same program or not um, and you, it's a residency, which is something I've always dreamed of trying to do. Uh, you, you do nothing but whatever it is you're there for. In other words, if it's a writing residency, you're housed someplace, you have a group of people who join together for meals, and then you write. It's a place where, and, mm. and people discuss what they're writing and they talk to each other about it. Mm. And there's usually. So like a writing retreat. It's like a writing retreat. Okay, right. Okay. Exactly. And it's famous for having them there. Huh. It, it's well, really it would insane. be a scenic place to do it. <laughs> yeah, it really is. And then I discovered some interesting history about Ovilar during World War II, mm -hmm. which is which which is interesting. I had, of course, no idea about. Um, to, just to back up a step, um, I think most people know a little bit, if not a lot, about what happened in France during World War II and under the occupation. And it is a fact that there were only two bishops in all of France who spoke out against uh, deportation and against the persecution of the Jews and against the persecution of the foreigners, the gypsies, or whoever else was being sent away to camps. And the most important of those two people was the Archbishop of Toulouse, Saliège, who became a cardinal at the end of his life and is considered a great hero. And the only other person who 
also did this, and of course it was a brave thing to do, was his friend who was the Bishop of Montauban. Oh, okay. Which is the city, really, that's the closest to sure. uh, Ovila. Sure, far, yeah. And uh, the, the uh, uh, bishop of, of Montauban was a man named uh, Pierre-Marie Théas. Uh, and there was a convent in Ovila, and it was an Ursuline convent. And he was good friends with the mother superior. Her name was Mary Placide. I think that's such a wonderful Placide. name. <laughs> Mère, Mère Marie Placide. Nice. Uh, and he asked her if the uh, nuns at this convent would help save some people. And so during uh, World War II, this convent at Ovilar uh, saved uh, over 50 people. They hid them. They either sent them to farmhouses, which is often how they w were sent away to, to farmers. Farmers were very brave during World War II in that respect. And a lot of them were children that were kept uh, in the convent and given false identity papers. And by the end of the war, absolutely not one of them was caught or sent away. Mm. Wow. And uh, it became so important that uh, several of these nuns that were part of this convent became listed on this list of the just, you know, the people ah. who saved people uh, that comes from Yad Vashem uh, in, in Israel. And I had no idea that this existed. And, it, and Ovilar apparently... For people who know about what went on during the resistance in World War II, it's a very important moment in the of history. Of course, it is. Yeah. You know, so, and it turns and out that I did not see a memorial to no. that or anything. No, you, know? you, you wonder sometimes. I don't. I don't know why sometimes they do memorials for things like that or not. I mean, well, and maybe there is one in, somewhere that was closed because there was a fair amount. You, you know, if I had been able to go to the tourist office and yeah. ask. What are all the things not to miss? It would have been they, if of there course. is a memorial hidden somewhere, right? I would have they have would have directed me. You to would it. have thought that maybe because there's a part of the convent apparently that still is there, but maybe it's on the inside. Apparently, the village was the kind of village where even the local gendarme participated in this, which was really not the common thing, unfortunately. No, you know? no. So it was really a village that had a good generous spirit in general that's great yeah. yeah so it was a nice little story to read about you yeah know. Uh, so th the other thing that i know about is that in the late 1600s middle 1600s they built this gorgeous ala ala au grain mm -hmm. uh, it's in the center square and it's really the the eye-catching the centerpiece it's the centerpiece really. of yeah. the village and it's beautiful because it's circular right you don't see circular uh Covered markets. Markets, right. Anywhere. This is the first one I remember seeing. And it's really fascinating to see how they uh, put together the beams to to give you the, you know, that's one of the things that I show in, the pictures, on, yeah. the, on, on my, in my video um, because it's really unusual. And the other thing that was interesting is that inside of the, of the grain market, they, they wrote... Uh, maïs, blé, orge. Ah. So you had sections that were dedicated to different, to different grains. grains. And they had one section where it said champard. So I was like, qu'est-ce que c'est le champard? Exactly. I was like, qu'est-ce que c'est le champard? So I looked it up. Champard. Chambre. No, it's a tax. <laughs> tax? It's the name of the tax that oh. they had to pay. So when you entered the thing, you had to go to the champagne table, uh -huh. pay your tax, and then you could sell. <laughs> weighed you. They weighed what you had, and then you could sell. Did they have yeah. any of the stones that, that you see in some villages that still exist, uh, usually in order to... The, the they they judge the, the quantity by volume. Yes, they had they, two of those. They 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 carve out the inside of these big stones and then they would fill them up. So there were two metal things that looked to me like measuring bushels uh -huh. type of things, uh, and there were two of them in the center of of the market. But I don't I didn't notice anything in stone, but. Yeah, it, it was clearly made it, for. It, they trade. may have replaced the original yeah. ones because the original yeah. ones were always made of stone. But well, I always wondered if they did that. How did they tip them over to get the grain out afterwards? <laughs> you know, it's like okay. You know, it was like 
Mm, all right, you need a big guy to do this. Yeah, I'm not yeah, sure. You you know. Somebody with some serious. But, but it's, uh, if I remember correctly, it's beautiful combination of brick and stone, right? Yeah, it, it's really gorgeous. It's the typical architecture of the yes. Southwest that way. Yes, you know? and it was also on the way to Compostela to Saint James, right. the Saint James Saint Jacques de Compostelle uh, pilgrimage. It's a very important stop. Yeah, so they have uh, they have a nod to that in front of the. Uh, in front of the tourist office, you have a big staff. It's a sculpture and a conch and the hand. No, oh. you have you have the staff and the hand and the hand. Um, and then they they have a little statue, not far from the the Clavid Market, uh, up up on the wall. There's a little statue of a pilgrim. So there's several nods to the pilgrims. You have this beautiful overlook. Yes. Um, that you so you're at the overlook and down at your feet is the Garonne River and you can see how placid it looks. Yes, and then all the way to the left, at the, in a distance, in the distance, you see the Golfesh uh, nuclear power plant, right. which right. has been there for years, for like years. decades, uh, and it's not had any major uh, scary things. The whole time I've lived here and I would have heard about it because my uncle used to be in charge of the protection civile pour la oh, centrale really? de Golfesh. Yeah. Yeah, it was um I think it's it's at least 40 years old, at least I think. You know, 40 45 years old. Oh, longer than I, that. I do know from uh my husband and other people that uh there was a huge amount of protest before it was Put of up, course, people you know. protest anything. Uh, it was because it's a very big one, and there was there was a lot of worry about it. But I have to say that I always find it very sinister looking because those smokestacks are so enormous and they give off so much smoke. And that isn't even the dangerous part. It's you not know. smoke. It's, it's the vapor. It's, it's yeah, it's, it's water vapor. vapor. But it, it's but it's very strange because when you to get to Ovilar, if you go by the auto route, you go up and down a couple of beautiful hills, and you come down and then go up, and then all of a sudden you see these stacks yeah. in the distance. You know. And it's like, whoa, they're big, you know. They're yeah, very, but the whole big. area is littered with houses that are clearly, there's some money in the area. This yeah. is not an impoverished part of France. No, 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 no. They're not worried about living near the nuclear power plant because there's magnificent private homes. There's <laughs> lots of chateaus. There. There's lots of <laughs> yeah. land. Well, the land is very rich. You know, to the south, it's the Gers, which is very rich agricultural land. And there's wine not far away either, you know. So it, it's actually good land of that whole area. Yeah. But going back to the, the, the Compostelle, because it's true, I had actually, I forgot about it. That, of course, started in the year about 1000. The stop before, if you take the very, you know, there are three or four specific routes to get to Compostelle. And of course, uh, Toulouse is a major stop on the route. But the one immediately before you get to Ovidar is a very small town that we really should do a podcast about called Moissac. Oh, uh, yeah. That, that I know uh, very, very well. Um, and uh, you, so every stop is a 25, maybe 30 kilometers from another stop, you know? Yeah. And then the stop after that is just a very small town that I never heard of. Uh, uh, so <laughs> called Saint Martin da Darats. So I thought that's interesting. On one side, it's something really well known. Yeah, Moissac, everybody's heard of Moissac. And, and on the it's other a, side, I mean, it's, it's like a, uh-huh, it's a small you know, city. Uh, Moissac is a small right, city. Exactly, a small yeah. city. And the other side is like this village. And I went, uh huh, you know. Yeah. And I even went online and I thought, no, I don't. There's nothing here. I mean, I don't know why. Why <laughs> it would be interesting to go there and discover why that became the next stop because I have no idea. It probably you know? was. A fact of the distance. They Probably. needed a stop for, you know, because even if you're a good walker, 30 kilometers a day for a pilgrim is a long way. They must know? have had a special either monastery or convent because uh, they always had a place for people to for stay. In yeah. fact, one of the things that still exists, well, now, of course, COVID, I'm staying still because I'm pretending that there's no COVID, but... In Ovilar, there is still a uh, part of the ancient convent that houses uh, six, has 16 beds for pilgrims coming through. Yes, and there were signs in the village. I saw signs here and there about that. Yeah. Uh, so it's still active. It's still active. Yeah. 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 I didn't see any pilgrims walking. I didn't see anybody with a staff or whatever. I, I wonder if the COVID hasn't put a stop on 
stuff Maybe. like that. Well, know. the thing is, usually when you when you stop at a village like that, that's on the Compostela route, you're fed. there is lots of people. Yeah, and and you see the pilgrims at restaurants right. and cafes because they take off their shoes right. and they have the backpacks right. and they have a staff. And right. I mean, you can't mistake you them can't miss them for no. anybody else. Right. So, but today, I, this time, I didn't see any because everything was closed. Everything's closed. Everything was closed. My so. guess is that it's been put on a hiatus you know i mean yeah. i don't think anybody's doing that right and now. and yet there were a lot of people there it you know i've complained uh, often how the uh, most beautiful villages some sometimes you go and everything's closed there's nothing to see there's not a soul around well that one was not like that that one was pretty lively even though nothing was open even though nothing was open there were a lot of people checking it out but of course it's probably because of this Village préféré des Français. Exactly. Right? So people right. want to check it out. Cause, they do want to check it out. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that's that's probably one of the reasons why there were so many people there. So the clock tower ah, yes. was built in the early 1600s under Louis XIV. Yeah. Uh, so it was. it is actually the, the, the marketplace, the circular marketplace, Unfortunately, uh, I mean, you and I wouldn't know it when we look at it, but part of it was actually renovated in the early 1800s. Probably, you know? yeah. But it, it dates. Well, you can't see it. You can't tell, but it, yeah. because they have to have uh, craftspeople who do the same work with the same materials, yeah. you know, always. I mean, that's the big deal about it. But um, so the oldest thing really standing right now are the houses. The houses, which date some of them from the 1400s and 1500s. Yeah. And they are really well taken care of. Yeah. So this was not a Bastide village. No. No. Uh, but the church is not right on the square either. So it's kind of interesting. It's in between. It's in between. Yeah. yeah. It, it's much later than Bastides anyway. Right. Because right? this, this, this village became... I mean, it grew and became very uh, wealthy. Uh, 1,650 years after yeah, all of that. Yeah. You know. uh, so they didn't build a Bastide. But it has a vibe like that because right. it has a lot of arches. Uh, it has this big circular market. Uh, it's the the church is not right at the center of the village. It's off center a little bit. So yeah, you you don't get the 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 feel of the village with just massive church, mass, right. massive square. You know, the church on one side and the mairie on the other. That the, no. <laughs> but it's interesting because you're right. It was not. A, it's not considered to be a bastide. Um, my guess is that the original buildings were the, the church building and the convent buildings, but the, when they, considering that this was a village that was invaded and basically rebuilt so many times from starting in the year 1000, mm -hmm. that eventually they kind of cleared out the space, made that beautiful circular marketplace. And so the church and the convent buildings get just put off to the side a little bit. Yeah. They you know. were, I mean, they're not far, but they're not far. Yeah. I mean, it's not because nothing's really far. No, you know? no. It's just really gorgeous. It's though, small. To walk yeah. Around. And, and with the bike, I rode around the village a little bit to, to get views and whatever. And it's just very nice from the, when you just leave the village on these little roads, uh, most of them have very few cars, right. you know, so it wasn't dangerous or anything. And it's just pleasant. You have a nice view because it's on top of a hill. So you have a nice valley. It's very bucolic and very beautiful and gardens. Very, very nice gardens, especially in early spring, right. like now, you know. So it, yeah, it's, it was really, really pleasant. And it felt so normal to be out because we hadn't done anything like this since October. So it was, you know, now it's March. It was March and we hadn't gone out of our house really since October. I know. And so now tomorrow we're going to go do another one and then we're locked down again for at least a month. At least a month. And ugh, it's just annoying. It's just getting on my nerves. But by the time I publish this, maybe it'll be over. So let's not talk about it too let's, much. Let's, <laughs> let's hope. Let's hope. Yeah. It, the, you know, the it doesn't say how many houses, but it is a village that has a very big collection of houses that are from the 1400s and 1500s and even 1600s that are in very good condition, which means they've been restored. Yeah. And I think part of that is because it has a flourishing artistic community. Yeah. And it's a place that does indeed attract a lot of people. Yeah. Beautiful red brick. Yeah. Just, just very friendly. And there was a lady who, uh, she, so there is, there's a market on Sunday morning uh, on the city square. And by the time we arrived, uh, we had 
eating our lunch and everything. So she was just putting away, but she was super friendly and uh, she was very proud of her. I made her, I asked her to pre- pronounce it for me to make sure uh. I was saying it right. You know, Cause sometimes, you know, I was, wasn't sure if it was Ovilar or Ovillar. Yeah. Cause it could be either, but it's Ovilar. It's Ovilar. Okay. Yeah. A local confirmed. And, um, she was very friendly. She told me about the most beautiful village and that, uh, favorite village of French people and all of that. And I was, it was a, very cute. It was cute. So yeah. she was a real resident there. Well, she was, she was a vendor. A vendor. She was, she was putting away, I don't know what she sold, but she was, she had her truck there and she uh-huh. was putting away her stuff after the end of the market. But these city markets, they're not so big anymore because of COVID. People don't travel so much. Right. And so there's not a lot of, um, no, you know, not so much activity there no. anymore, but it'll come back. It'll come back. And it, ironically, uh, the list of things that are closing down, that is not. I mean, whatever little open air markets exist, they will allow it to be kept open. Right. The question is, will people, people come? go? Yeah. Will yeah, people go? More than That's, anything else. Yeah. There, there are a bunch of BMBs. There are three art galleries. There are a, a few Jeet houses or apartments that are for rent. Yeah. Uh, probably more on the outside of the village, I would imagine. Um, and uh, there are a couple of hotels. I'm not sure if, uh, if where they are exactly. I did not notice one. They're probably very big, small, I would think. Right by the clock tower, there's a big thing. I can't remember if it's at Hôtel de l'Horloge or Restaurant de l'Horloge. It could be both. It could probably be, could be it both. Could be it both. looked like a big, could, nice establishment. But it was, it everything was closed. Everything was closed. Yeah. So, you know. But the three art galleries, one of them is this big cooperative. That's the one I remember going to. And they have... Uh, a big show at some point every summer, uh, yeah, and then people come from all over to go to. So, so I didn't get get to try the gastronomy or the wine. No, no, no. because you know closed. No. But, <laughs> but eventually, I'll go back one of these it, days. The, the, I'll stop the, it's by. close to the prunes of Agen, and it's close yeah. to the fruit from Wasac. But I don't know. Aside from the fact that it's and on the other side, it's close to Gers, which means duck. Yeah, there's got to be duck everything. There's got to be duck everything. Yeah. There's got to be a lot of quacking there. You know? Yeah. <laughs> really. You know, it's just, it's right on the cusp between and all of these different regions that are famous for something or one one thing ed- that's edible or another. You yeah. Know? And I don't think that they, I didn't see a lot of vineyards uh, driving there. But of course, I, you spend most of the time on the freeway. And yeah. from the freeway, you don't really see that sort of thing. You, you know. No, but it is interesting. If anybody's going to visit there, it's a place from there you can go basically south into the Gers region, which is very, very agricultural, bucolic, and rolling hills. You can go north and go into the area uh, where, in fact, you're going to go vill- visit the other village, uh, to one of the other villages tomorrow, that's very dense with old villages and that gets you into the lot area if you go further north. Uh, so it really is interesting because it's situated in a place where from there you can go to a lot of other places at the yeah. same time. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Elise. You are quite welcome, Annie. <laughs> Au revoir. Au revoir. Again, I want to thank my patrons for supporting the show and giving back. Patrons get several exclusive rewards for doing so. You can see them at patreon.com forward slash join us. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Join us, no spaces or dashes. Thank you all for supporting the show. Some of you have been doing it for a long time. You're wonderful. And a shout out this week to new patron Leanne Davidson. Thank you very much for becoming a patron and making this podcast possible. And thank you, Mark Reynoso, for upgrading to yearly support. Port. I published a video for patrons this week, one of my favorite city in France, Toulouse, my fair city where I was born and raised. I'm also working on two French history briefs. Wish me luck. I'll ride a bike in Paris to shoot some video for patrons. That should be exciting. I've never ridden a bike in Paris. I've driven in Paris a lot, but never ridden a bike. We We'll see if I survive. Another way to support this podcast is to hire me to be your itinerary consultant. I've been doing a bunch of these each week. And today I want to do a shout out to Franklin, who is 12 and one of my youngest listeners, I'm told. I talked to your mom, Franklin. She'll take you to all the best places in Paris for geeky kids. 
you will have a wonderful time in Paris, you guys. To see how those custom itineraries work, take a look at joinusinfriends.com forward slash boutique. My thanks also to Yves Zutti for sending in a one-time donation by using the green button on any page on Join Us in France that says, tip your guide. This week in French news, by the time you hear this episode, 42% of French people will have received a first dose of the vaccine and 20% will have had both doses. So we continue to vaccinate up a storm in France. There's a small uptick in the number of positive tests, which is not great, but trends are still down overall for the number of new infections and people in the hospital and all that. So we're not out of the COVID wood, but we're going in the right direction in France. So let's hope it continues. Now, what about travel to France? France will reopen to foreign visitors on June 9th, as announced. But when I announced, we didn't know how this would all work. Uh, and now we know. The rules will change depending on the country from which you are traveling and whether you are vaccinated or not. I'll summarize these rules for you now and you can read through this in the show notes because you probably won't remember all of this, which is fair. There are green, orange and red countries. I suppose countries may go from one color to another, but that's not going to happen a lot because, you know, it's a pandemic. It takes time to turn these things around. Today, June 5th, 2021, the countries listed as green are all the countries in the EU, which does not include the UK. You know, let's remind ourselves. Uh, plus Australia, Israel, Japan, Lebanon, New Zealand, Singapore, and South Korea. If you come from a green country and you can prove that you're fully vaccinated, you can come, no questions asked, okay? Just in, no problem. If you're from a green country and you're not vaccinated, then you will need a PCR or antigenic test within 72 hours of your, you taking the flight. Most countries in the world are in the orange category, which includes the US, the UK, and Canada. I will not list all the orange countries because that's most of the countries in the world. But if you're not red and you're not green, then you're orange, okay? Uh, if you're from an orange country, those who are fully vaccinated will need proof of vaccination and a PCR test that you've taken no more than 72 hours before you board the flight or an antigen test of less than 48 hours. People from orange countries who are not vaccinated cannot come to France unless they have a pressing reason for doing so. I've talked about those pressing reasons before. I won't go into it na right now, but let me just say that coming to France for fun and for travel is not a pressing reason. <laughs> If you come from a red country and you've been fully vaccinated, you uh, will not be able to come for leisure, only compelling reasons, Plus, you'll need a PCR or antigen test of less than 48 hours, plus seven days of self-isolation. If you're coming from a red country and you have not been vaccinated, you'll need the recent test plus a 10-day quarantine with uh, verification from the authorities. What countries are on the red list? Argentina, Bahrain, Bangladesh, Bolivia, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, India, Nepal, Pakistan, South Africa, Sri Lanka, Suriname, Turkey, and Uruguay. And I was careful to say if you're coming from one of these countries, it's not, this has nothing to do with your nationality. It's where are you coming from? So if you're a French citizen, uh, or someone of any nationality coming from one of the red countries, these 
conditions still apply to you, okay? Uh, I've heard French people complain, uh, of course, French people complain, that's normal, that, you know, the cops are knocking on their door to in- to make sure that uh, that they're staying uh, home during their quarantine. And uh, yeah, the <laughs> it's also worth mentioning that if you've been vaccinated with a vaccine that is not approved in the EU, so like the Chinese or Russian vaccine, Uh, then it's like you haven't been vaccinated at all. And, you know, what goes around comes around. So I've been vaccinated with AstraZeneca, which has been approved in Europe, but not in the U.S. So I guess it's possible that should I need to go to the U.S., they would think I haven't been vaccinated. We'll see. I'm not going to the U.S. anytime soon. So it's fine. But uh, these, these things will get sorted out. But, you know, there's still a lot of areas of uncertainty around traveling right now, which is why I think it might be best not to travel right now for a while anyway. Another thing that is still in flux a little bit is how do you prove that you've been vaccinated? In France, uh, we have the Tout Santi Covid app, and it's set up to to be our proof. Other countries in Europe will accept that as valid proof. I'm assuming that it will also be valid proof in the US or anywhere I go. But I'm not sure what is going to be valid proof for people coming in from other countries. So, you know, so to keep up with all these rules for most of my listeners who are listening from the US, uh, I recommend you follow the account of the French embassy in the US. They're on Facebook and on Twitter and what they post is informative and up to date. So I would go to that uh, for, for for all of these kind of details. For my personal update this week, I'm very excited for my trip to Paris next week. Elise and I will get on a TGV train and head for Montparnasse. We'll be spending a few days with a great friend of the podcast and a great friend of mine, Patricia Perry. Patricia has lined up exciting visits for us. She booked all the tickets. She's wonderful. Uh, I'll get her on the podcast to talk about this uh, so you learn from the pro. (laughs) But if you, you know, if you can stand to give it some time, don't come right away because it's going to take several weeks for things to work themselves out for everybody along the whole long chain of people. Think about all the things that happen between the time you leave your, you leave your house to go to the airport and the time you get to your hotel in Paris. You are going to deal with a number of people who may or may not know about all of these things, who may or may not ask you for different papers or whatever. So for now, if, if you don't have to come right away, I would give it a little more time. We've not traveled for over a year already and, you know, we haven't died, so... <laughs> give it give it some time. Also, I've been using the City Mapper app for Paris for a few years and it's really great, but they've updated it. Um so now for Paris, it, they will show you bike and scooter rentals and also places to get tested for COVID in Paris. So, you know, because coming to France is one thing, but then you have to deal with different rules to get home, right? Because they'll probably want you to get tested before you get home. Now, the the, the thing is in France, getting tested for COVID is pretty easy and it's free, which it's, as far as I know, it's not free anywhere else, even in Europe. Uh, so, um, but you still need to know where to go to get your, <laughs> to get your test, right? And another app that Patricia recommends is the Fork app because it allows you to make reservations from the app. So that's very handy dandy. And right now you need reservations for everything, including sitting down in a restaurant. It's a pain. Show notes for this episode are on joinusinfrance.com forward slash 340, the numeral 340, where you can see a recap of what we've discussed, as well as links to relevant resources. And if you enjoy the show, for heaven's sakes, what are you waiting for? Introduce a friend to the podcast and show them how to listen. If they are Francophiles, they will thank you. Next week on the podcast, an episode on buying an apartment in Paris with Paulette Garagos. She found herself a sweet, sweet place in Paris and she shares how. Send questions or feedback to Annie at joinusinfrance.com. Thank you so much for listening and I hope you join me next time so we can look around France together. Au revoir.
The Join Us in France Travel Podcast is written, hosted, and produced by Annie Sargent and copyright 2021 by Addicted to France. It is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license.